time is 7.34 p.m. And today is Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the zoning board, when I call your name, you just indicate you're here. Uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. John O'Rourke. John, I thought I saw your number. Star six. Here. There we are. Here. Go. Sorry, here. Yep, thank you. Uh, Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Wonderful. Uh, so town officials, uh, Rick Valarelli. Here. And Vincent Lee. Here. Thank you. And Kelly Linema is just logging in right this moment. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Welcome. Um, persons appearing for 1165R Mass Ave, uh, our MHP consultant, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Haverty. Uh, from Beta Group, um, Greg Lucas. Here. Is Marty joining us, Greg? I'm not sure. Okay. I would have expected so, but I, we, we never actually talked to confirm that. So. I legally remember something about her not being available, but I just can't recall. That may be the case. Okay. Um, and representing the applicant, um, Mary O'Connor. Here. And Brian Zamolka. Here. Wonderful. It's, uh, Ms. O'Connor, is there anyone else uh, from your team? Uh, Julia Myrak um, uh, will may be speaking, and other members of the team are on the call as well. Daniel St. Clair from Spalding and Sly. Hello. Good Hello. Bob Myrak is also on the call. One and all. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of, I can't believe I'm saying this, March 12, 2020. That order suspended the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer, audio, or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Well, we, we have one item on our agenda this evening, evening as the uh, comprehensive permit hearing. We're now turning hearing for 1165R Massachusetts <laughs> Avenue, continued from February 23rd, 2021. Want to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. This evening's discussion will focus on transportation aspects of the proposed project. The submitted documents are available as an attachment to the posted agenda and on the board's website for the 1165R Mass Ave project. I'll ask the applicants to introduce themselves and make a presentation to the board outlining the traffic and transportation aspects of the project. I'll then ask the board's consultant, Beta Group, to provide additional comments on those same aspects. Members of the board will then have an opportunity to ask what questions they have on the information that has been presented and after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. So with that, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Uh, I'd like to initially thank the zoning board members and the town departments in beta for their work on this comprehensive permit. 
And I wanna thank Beta and the departments and the abutters for their comments in advance of tonight's meeting uh, because we, will be able, we were able to integrate responses. Tonight, Brian Zamolka of Niche Engineering will review the extensive traffic impact report, which was previously made available in connection with this comprehensive permit application. It has been amended based on uh, input uh, from beta and responses that have been formulated to beta's concerns, as well as some comments from the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and Rider Street residents. Mr. Zamolka is a professional engineer and focuses his practice on transportation permitting and traffic engineering design services. To give you just some little background, he was the chair of the Boston Society of Civil Engineers section in the Institute of Transportation Engineers. He is gonna review the results of the traffic study, the parking to be provided, access points and the proposed transportation demand management plan that the applicant is offering. I do wanna update the zoning board to advise that uh, the applicant has, uh, with Mr. Zamolka and I, met with attorney Robert Anessi, who spoke, spoke at the initial hearing. Attorney Anessi will not be appearing in opposition tonight. Uh, I can represent, he has represented that to me. I wanna address several matters that, will, uh, that Mr. Zamolka will not be addressing. Uh, I have provided information to the zoning board that the uh, Myrak family actually owns by deed that section of Ryder Street that exits from the site to the opposite side of Ryder Street going to Forest Street. Uh, the, so the applicant surveyors have advised that the town of Arlington actually owns that portion of Ryder Street abutting the sidewalk in front of nine Ryder Street, which is the condominium building. I raise this for two reasons. It establishes ownership of the right of way and um, because some of the neighbors have expressed concern that Ryder Street is narrow, but as if the zoning board members looked at what was uh, provided, and I'm sure you did, you will see that the survey reveals that 23 Ryder Street, the yards actually encroach into the right of way. Further, um, the neighbors have raised concerns about uh, trucks coming down the street, uh, likely from the DPW yard uh, and coming at uh, excessive rates of speed. I think that that's something that should be referred to the town manager. And given the fact that the town has taken the other side of Ryder Street, uh, where the condominium is, that the zoning board could in fact provide that automobiles not park within a certain distance of the Ryder exit from the project site. With respect to the MBTA temporary service cuts due to the pandemic that the Transportation Advisory uh, Committee references in their memorandum, we're not going to address them because they are temporary in nature. They're related to the pandemic. This project, if approved, will not be up and running for a year and a half to two years. Uh, I would suggest to you that based on the information that Mr. Zamolka will be presenting this evening, that the trips to and from the site are modest that there are several access points. And to the extent that the Ryder Street residents have concerns about town operated trucks and equipment, this can be addressed with the town. Um, so I would like to uh, turn this over to Mr. Zamolke if I could. Thank you, Mary. Um, I provided or I put together a presentation that I've given to Rick and I'm hoping he could bring it up right now. Uh, maybe I can chime in. Uh, we were having trouble loading that onto Nova's agenda just because it was such a large file. Um, I think Rick was hoping that maybe you could share your screen. Yep, I have. I did have a contingency plan. Um, I think Brian, I can... you're all set to go. I actually uh, set that up for you a little while ago. Uh, to share my screen. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, all right, can everybody see this? To be honest with you, I was yes. not prepared to share my screen, so I don't know how to do uh, full screen, but let's go with this. All right, so good evening, everybody. As mentioned, my name is Brian Zamoko. I'm the traffic engineer on the job. Um, tonight, I'm going to be going through uh, this project, a uh, quick overview of the project, um, where we're at with the traffic impact report. Uh, there have been some recent updates uh, since we've had the uh, 
have been provided comments. Um, and then we're gonna uh, start to address all the comments, the beta comments from the town, the transportation advisor committee comments, and then the neighborhood feedback comments. So just to get started, a quick summary of the project. This project involves the renovation of the existing mill building on site, and it's gonna uh, be, con we're gonna be constructing two new buildings and renovating two existing buildings to include 130 units, uh, which would include 187 bedrooms. Um, there's being, as part of the development, two parking garages are constructed and on site, a, a total of 133, uh, 135 parking spaces will be provided, 124 of those in the garage, 11th surface. Um, there's currently a shared parking plan agreement with the work bar, and that will be to provide 40 spaces for the work bar um, during the weekday, midday in the parking garage and 10 spaces uh, and nights and weekends. And as Mary mentioned, we are proposing uh, to use three access points that I'll go through later. So this is where we're at right now. This is the existing site and existing site access. So currently the uh, site is being accessed um, via the three, three uh, points shown here. So the Massachusetts Avenue West driveway, the Quinn Road, and um, the Ryder Street driveway. You can see that all three of these driveways have two-way access. Um, and I'm gonna go into what we're proposing in the future, but you will note that abutters all have two-way access and access for them will be maintained uh, even when we have the build out of the project. So what you can also see is there's uh, significant bike accommodations. Um, along Massachusetts Avenue, there are painted bike markings, uh, formerly known as sharrows, so they're shared with the lanes. Um, there is bike access along Forest and Ryder Street, and then there's direct bicycle access um, from Ryder Street to the Minuteman Bikeway. Um, there's also publicly accessible sidewalk all around the site. Um, you can see to the uh, the site is uh, accessible sidewalk along Forest Street and Ryder Street and then directly into the driveway. Currently, there is no sidewalk along the Mass Ave driveway um, and we'll go into that a little later. Um, you'll also see that there's two transit stops at the Appleton Street uh, Mass Ave intersection. Um, that I, th I think that's all I wanted to mention here. Um, Let's move on. So the existing traffic study. So if you've reviewed the existing traffic study, you've uh, seen this diagram. This represents all the intersections studied. So we studied Mass Ave at Appleton Street, Mass Ave at Forest and the West Driveway, at Pine Court, Queen Road, Forest at Ryder Street, and Ryder, the Ryder Street Driveway. And also we studied the West Driveway um, as it approaches the bridge over the Millbrook on site. Um, later, we'll, I'll compare the uh, existing to the proposed traffic volumes and I'll show you what the existing site generates in itself. So where we're going in the proposed condition. So this represents the site access and mobility in the future. So what we're doing, we, we are restricting access at two driveways. So we're going to, at the West driveway, it's for uh, the tenants and residents only. We're gonna have ingress only at the West driveway, egress only, so out at the Ryder Street driveway and provide two way access at the Quinn Road uh, driveway. Please keep in mind that this access change is only for the tenants and residents. Butters will not be, uh, um, have restricted access. They will have two way, access at all these driveways. Um, you will also notice that the publicly accessible route uh, for the sidewalk, um, or there's a sidewalk along Forest Street and Ryder Street that will be, uh, it's a publicly accessible route that leads to an on-site sidewalk that is designed to be ADA compliant. Um, the access, the bicycle access, like I said, is not gonna change and it will still be uh, direct access from Ryder Street to the Minuteman bikeway. So the proposed traffic volumes, this is kind of, I, I wanna touch on this a little bit because there's this um, 
understanding that a development with 130 units is going to generate uh, a lot of tra traffic and there's been concern about that um, but when you you have to also think that we are replacing an existing building so there are a net amount of trips and um, i'll go through this but the result is the net amount of trips is minor when you think about the development so i want to draw your attention to the the table on the bottom left side of the slide you will see that this development net trips is only adding 15 total trips to the site in the morning and 29 trips in the evening. Um, I would say, and I think it can be agreed that that is very marginal for this, for this development. Um, going driveway by driveway, here the Ryder Street driveway in the morning and evening is only uh, anticipated to add an additional one trip. Um, the Mass Ave West driveway will actually see a reduction in two trips in the morning and an additional, only additional 16 trips in the evening. And Quinn Road will see an additional 16 trips in the morning and additional 12 trips in the evening. Um, as I mentioned before, we wanted to use these access points and we're gonna uh, convey the access to the tenants and the residents to provide that equitable, equitable distribution of traffic. Um, I want to also note that it's not shown on this, this uh, diagram, but in the study, you will see that they, we did a capacity analysis, a traffic capacity analysis that measures queuing and delay uh, along the roadways. The, this development is anticipated to have a very minimal increase in queuing and delay, which um, is, is you know, deemed very, very good by traffic engineering standards. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. So we also, so when laying out the site and designing the site, we had to uh, determine what the parking demand was going to be. And the best way to do that is to study developments uh, of similar type, similar size, and in similar locations. So the three sites we studied are the Brigham Square Apartments, the Legacy at Arlington Center Apartments, and the Arlington 360 apartment complex, all highlighted on this slide. Um, Julia Myrak is going to give a quick uh, couple of bullets about the legacy. So, Julia. Uh, good evening. Um, at the time that we built the legacy, which was back in 2000, we anticipated needing um, quite a bit of parking. We anticipated needing all of the spaces that we built. Over the 20 years that we've owned and operated the Legacy, we've seen a steady decline in the number of parking spaces needed and the number of parking spaces rented by our tenants. Um, I think that we can contribute that to the fact that we have direct access to the bike path, that there's a bus stop directly in front of the Legacy, right in the center. And over the years, we've seen that in general, families just seem to have fewer cars, a lot of um, two car families became one car families and we're seeing a lot of families moving in with just one car. Um, so Brian and his team took this information into account when they were working on this traffic study and I think it supports the idea that um, cars are being used less frequently in Arlington than uh, we had anticipated 20 years ago. Thank you, Thank you Julia. So I want to <laughs> Uh, I want to take uh, the time to note that um, at the time of uh, we conducted the traffic study, uh, we gathered parking occupancy information through our own counts at the Legacy Brigham and Arlington 360, in addition to the information provided by the management offices. And um, to confirm our data, we followed up with the management and they confirmed that the, act, the counts we collected were representative of their own information. So that was that was good to that was good to note. Um, the results from that parking study uh, says that or generated that 0.55 spaces will be required per bedroom, which equates to 107 parking spaces uh, needed for the residents um, during the midday, because we want to determine there's that shared parking agreement where 40. Uh, parking spots are going to be allocated to work park. We want to see what the parking occupancy would be for the residents during that same time. So what we found was there is an 18% reduction from the peak utilization 
to the midday and uh, during the weekday midday and a 9% reduction on Saturday, Saturday midday. So when you combine the necessarily uh, the necessary parking with the shared parking plan, um, 124 parking spaces will be required uh, during the wid wid weekday midday, that's including that 40, and 113 spaces will be required on the weekends, which in includes that 10. So it could be concluded based on our study that 135 spaces would be sufficient to meet the anticipated demand. So this diagram really shows, I, I wanna point to the parking accommodations here. Um, there is, when laying out the site, there was a couple of, um, there's a couple of butter concerns. Um, Robert and Nessie, the Mr. Nessie at the law office, um, stated a couple of concerns that he wanted to maintain two-way traffic flow for himself, the Hyundai, um, and all of Butters. Um, so that's when we, you know, listening to him and the residents, we decided to maintain that two-way access and find the best means to uh, accommodate that. Um, there was also some concerns about excessive speeding coming through the parking lot and around that west driveway. So what we're proposing is to provide a speed bump um, right at that the, the tip, if you will, of the west driveway, right as it um, meets the Quinn Ave connector. Um, as right now, it's kind of the preliminary means uh, thoughts of traffic management. Um, we also want to clearly mark the parking restrictions at the Anessi Law Office. So we're gonna uh, we're working with Mr. Anessi to come up with the best signage uh, to be used uh, to really restrict parking there. Um, and we wanna provide clear demarcation of where uh, residents and work bar parking are. Now, I'll show later in the presentation, we are providing a, uh, a diagram for all tenants and residents, but the signage is kind of further um, indicates where the resident parking is and to that they will not be able to use any abutter parking. So the uh, other concern was the Ryder Street, and this came from the, the neighborhood. We, there wanted to be a limited amount of traffic from the work or generated by the work bar on Ryder Street, which is why we have allocated to exit only and we're restricting uh, turns to left only out there. And that's so, uh, residents and tenants do not use the Beck Road neighborhood as a means to uh, leave the, the uh, neighborhood. Um, and there are additional provisions that we are making that um, to manage traffic that we'll go through later in, in the presentation. So the transportation demand management. This is a, this is a long list, but in the report we've uh, we listed quite a few things. We listed the orientation packets, bicycle accommodations, electrical vehicle charging, shared car services, a transportation, on-site transportation coordinator, a project website, and a transportation monitoring program. Those all will be in place to um, you know, provide additional transportation measures. But we all, I wanted to highlight here, uh, so after we received comments and received the feedback, we went, uh, back to the, not back to the drawing board all the way, but wanted to expand on the measures and provide more. So uh, just a quick run through of this and you could read it yourself if you, if you want, but each new resident will be provided the information um, to the transit alternatives, as I mentioned before, to be a hundred dollar gift certificate for the apartment upon lease execution. 5% of the parking space will be provided for electrical vehicles. Um, all resident parking will be charged at market rates uh, for reserved and unreserved spaces. Um, we're going to provide a continuous accessible sidewalk to the project along Millbrook, as I mentioned before. Uh, as the there'll be an on-site coordinator, uh, on-site transportation director, sorry, uh, with active piking, parking, biking, and transportation management. There'll be short-term uh, site parking for rideshare deliveries, visitor parking. There'll be interior and exterior bike parking. Um, there'll be bike repair and maintenance stations within the building. Um, and all parking for resident work bar tenants will be controlled by uh, either a sticker or a placard or some kind of indication that they have, uh, they're allowed to park there. Um, 
and as I mentioned before, there's going to be a shared parking with the work bar to accommodate the 40 spaces uh, during the weekday midday and the 10 on the evenings and weekends. Uh, so back to this tenant diagram that I said. Um, so this is will be part of the orientation packets. Um, this will be given to all the, the abutters, or I'm sorry, not the abutters, the attendants and residents, showing the access that has to be, that's allowable. So you have the one way in West, uh, the West driveway off Mass Ave, you have two way off Quinn Road and you have uh, left only out, out of Ryder Street. And this will also indicate um, the abutter parking only and that no uh, tenants or residents will be allowed to park there. And that's uh, noted on here by the red highlighted areas. So I, I have more to the presentation, but I kind of wanted to take this opportunity to open it up uh, for the comments, if everybody's okay with that, for the beta and the, trans the um, transportation advisory committee comments. So Greg? Uh, that, that'll be fine. Um, Greg, did you want to jump in at this point? Uh, sure. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't have um, slides to review, but we have had some back and forth. We have, and and fortunately, Brian's got it right here in his in his uh, presentation. We we prepared a letter um, with our initial review, uh, dated February sixteenth, and we received re responses back from from Brian from Niche um, last week, dated uh, March 9th. And so we've had a couple conversations with Brian since then. Um, to go over some of these comments. And um, I, I don't know if the board members have had a chance to read through our letter, but you know, the focus, there, there, were some, there were some minor details of the report and the responses have already provided clarification on those, um, just to make sure we understand the conclusions that are being made, the numbers that are being presented. And that was you know, clarified pretty directly and clearly. Um, there are primary focus of our comments were um, access and parking. And so I think um, Brian has effectively um, presented the intent of the, um, the site layout, the intent of the access, the connectivity for pedestrians, for bicycles, um, the control for vehicles of the various um, site access points and the um, program that they undertook with regards to parking. We're, we're, still, we're still not quite on the same page in agreement with how they've justified that parking demand, but um, I think we might just need a little more um, information clarification on that to make sure that we have, that the site provides adequate parking. Um, we also had some comments related to the site layout, um, which we would expect when we see, when we see although the site layout plan was included, um, some of the garage layout was shown with some vehicle um, passenger turning movements to show maneuverability into the spaces. Um, we had some comments there that we'll clarify once we see that full revised um, site plan package, just to make sure because, because the, sh the parking will be shared between um, the work bar tenants and the residents, um, we want to make sure that the garage is maneuverable. The work bar tenants will be, you know, more, uh, more frequent in outs. It won't, you know, not residents that maybe not residents that use it every day. And so we want to make sure that that um, those combinations of uses can be accommodated um, and can share that space within the garage. So that's just a quick overview and I'd be happy to answer um, any of the board's questions on the specifics of our review. Thank you. I don't believe um, anyone is here from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, we do have their comments here. Um, I mean, if you want me to just go through them, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to go through them. I wouldn't go through them all because a lot of them do echo Beta's comments. Um, a lot of them are in agreement, provide this more information. So it, it's um, they do echo a lot of each other, but the Transportation Advisory Board in their comment letter, I, I do want to point this out, had um, some recommendations uh, for the TDM program. Now, I want to note that um, Beta 
um, in their comment letter had agreed with the TDM program that we have provided. And that's prior to us um, outlining all the additional uh, measures that we were going to take in. But to highlight what the uh, TAC said is they recommended um, having MBTA subsidized passes. Now, we looked at that and we, we thought, well, we're only expecting about 20% of the tenants, um, residents and tenants to be using transportation as a mode of, or transit as a primary mode of transportation. So we, we feel that offering the bike room with the special amenities and the transportation coordinator and everything else we have will entice the use of the Minuteman bike trail um, and shift traffic uh, away from single occupancy vehicles. Um, one of the other comments they had is requesting a sidewalk along Massachusetts, the Mass Ave driveway. Um, and we are limited by right of way and uh, pure uh, infrastructure or, uh, limitations. So the, two, the Mass Ave driveway is only right now 20 feet wide. Um, being that we want to maintain a butter, uh, a butter, two-way butter access for Mr. Nessie, the Hyundai, and all the abutters, um, we cannot narrow that to provide a sidewalk. Um, the second reason is the grading on that driveway is not um, the best. Uh, does not meet ADA accessibility to be, to build a new sidewalk. Um, for a new sidewalk, the longitudinal slope is five percent, and as you can see on the the right drawing, you have uh, slopes at 6%, 12%, 10%. So there is that physical barrier that will not allow us to provide that sidewalk. But as we showed before, there's the publicly accessible route to the Ryder Street driveway uh, via Forest, Street, uh, Forest and Ryder that leads right to that, oh, excuse me, ADA sidewalk that's gonna be built on site. Can I just add one thing? As a matter of law, we could not alter the in and out access of the two abutters who have the right to use that easement, even if we wanted to. The property, the Myrax uh, have the dominant easement, but they cannot alter um, access by either Attorney Onessi or the Myrax dealership next door as a matter of law. Thank you, Mary. So now I want to dive into the, the neighborhood feedback, which is great feedback. You know, really appreciate these comments up front. Um, so I'm just going to address these one by one. So the first one is the volume. Uh, the comment is, we don't understand why Beck Road wasn't included in the measurement as it was the primary entry and exit points for vehicles in our block. So I uh, mentioned that before, and Beck Road is not uh, within the primary study location because it is not expected to be impacted, uh, greatly impacted by the development. Um, the fact that we have traffic restricted to left only out uh, forces no site generated traffic to go right and use Beck, uh, Beck Road as a means of egress um, go and go through the neighborhood. Um, the second comment, the patterns. So a Tuesday and Wednesday in February isn't representative of the volume on our street as most of the neighboring businesses are dormant in the winter and more active other seasons. So as traffic engineering standard, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday are considered uh, average days of the week. And February represents volumes that are 3% lower than your peak month, which is why um, in our traffic studies, we uh, increase the volumes that were counted by that 3% um, to represent the peak month. So um, with, and then with regards to the DCR on Ryder Street, these trucks um, represent a very small percentage of the overall network volume. So it's not anticipated that they will significantly or if at all affect the traffic analysis. However, the, uh, the DCR was taken into consideration when restricting access and, um, to minimize the interactions. So the mix, the mix of ped volumes. So this is our biggest concern as we have a high volume of pedestrian traffic either on their way to the bike path or middle school, as well as atypical heavy equipment 
which this study may not account for. So volumes were obtained on Ryder Street, and what we gathered was there was 32 pedestrians during the morning peak. Um, interactions between the existing pedestrian traffic and vehicles are not anticipated to change because as I showed before, there's only going to be an increase of one trip in the morning and one trip in the evening. So um, as I mentioned, there's not, there's, we don't expect a change in interactions there. Um, parking. So Ryder Street has a parking deficit, which gets overwhelmed on a regular basis, as is displacing access for residents. Is this being taken into account in the current study? So um, as, as we mentioned before, through our parking study and the parking accommodations on site, we are not anticipating residents or tenants to park on Ryder Street. Um, significant parking will be provided uh, even with uh, visitors, guests, uh, and short-term parking. So we don't anticipate any, any site-related cars parking on Ryder Street. Um, so to the qualitative assessment, the existing signage markings and no sidewalk. Um, so I wanted to bring this slide back up again. Um, as we mentioned before, to control the site traffic and improve Ryder Street, the proponent is proposing to add the no right turn uh, sign at um, the Ryder Street driveway. Uh, gonna repave Ryder from Forest to the driveway. And I'll show you the, a little uh, diagram of that in, in a second. And install wheelchair ramps at the condo complex driveway um, at 9 Ryder Street. And I'll, I'll, in a later slide, I'll show you that too. So the blind turn. The turn from the 1165 property onto Ryder is blind due to the line of parked cars and elevation change which is even more challenging when you consider the unpredictable nature of the vehicle movement on our street. So this section of Ryder is a private way that we cannot change parking regulations to. Um, what we can offer at this point and what we recommend is to have a conversation with the town about these changes um, in, in hopes that they can assist uh, in with this issue. Um, variable geometry. Our street is a glorified parking lot which varies in width and condition leading to unpredictable behavior. Um, we understand the neighborhood's concerns um, about this, but as mentioned, we do not anticipate uh, the development affecting parking on Ryder Street. So on to the viable alternative, access points. Are two access points necessary for a development of size? Developers uh, said they have built complexes larger than this with one curb cut. So why are two being proposed? Well, there are actually three being proposed. Um, the access, the, the points aren't changing themselves. There's still access points to the site. However, we are limiting mobility through them. Um, and we're doing this to provide, as I mentioned, an equitable distribution of traffic so as to not concentrate all the uh, impacts onto one location. And in, when I say impacts, they are minor, but we want to make sure it's distributed anyway. Um, Mass Ave access. The intersection of Forest Street and Mass Ave is one of the most dangerous in Arlington and the state. How much safer would this be if entry exit point was moved from 1165 Mass Ave which is 80 feet from that intersection to 1125 Mass Ave, which is 450 feet from the same intersection. So 1125 Mass Ave is um, adjacent to Quinn Road. So we actually are providing that, uh, that access point there. Um, I apologize if that was um, not conveyed properly in the report, but I hope that everybody now through this presentation can understand what we are providing for access. Suggested improvements. What infrastructure improvements would you deem necessary to accommodate the current design in a way that meets existing standards for what is essentially a shared street? So as I mentioned, uh, so some of the improvements that we're, that we're considering, um, reconstructing the wheelchair ramps at Nine Rider Street driveway. Um, I pointed those out um, on the diagram or the area on the left and 
you can see the picture on the right of uh, the two non-existent ramps um, at that driveway. So we'll be uh, proposing new wheelchair ramps with detectable warning paddles to meet ADA compliance. Um, repave Ryder Street from Forest to the driveway. Uh, that's denoted by the blue highlights on the left. And also install pavement markings for crosswalks on Ryder Street to improve uh, pedestrian mobility. Um, anticipating change. There is a high likelihood that two additional adjacent properties would be developed in the next five years as well. How would this change the estimated usage and design recommendations? So all project aspects, and this is with every project um, that we do, all project aspects anticipate future uh, projects coming online. The town is, uh, when, when we're doing the study, the town is contacted to identify any uh, information or any projects that are in the site or in the proximity. Um, future project, the future projects were built into the, uh, the um, future traffic estimation. Um, and also they were built into our design for site access and uh, parking accommodations. Um, so then there was this next slide uh, about the disproportionate burden. Um, we reviewed the graph and it is very informative um, but it does not accurately represent the site's Ryder Street utilization. Um, I just wanna focus your attention back to the Ryder Street um, volumes. And as I've shown before, Ryder Street, uh, as, as it's gonna be utilized by the uh, development is only expected to increase the traffic um, one trip in the morning and evening peak hours. So um, as this shows, 135 cars with the 100, a utilization factor of 2,426. Um, we see this as not as impactful as that graph represents because the volume, uh, the net volumes is very low. So that concludes my presentation and I will pass the torch on. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lucas, did you have anything further you wanted to add? Yeah, I just add some points, um, some summary points based on the community feedback. Um, you know, a confirmation of some of the things that, that Mr. Zamolka said. Um, the, the Beck Road wasn't included in the study because the site isn't anticipating um, sending traffic on the Beck Road, specifically their, their proposing signage that would restrict turns towards Beck Road onto Ryder Street towards Beck Road. So there would be no increased traffic on Beck Road. Um, with regards to data collection, yes, February, we have um, adjustment factors where that can be adjusted to an average month. And so that was done as part of the study. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday are appropriate days to do traffic counts. Typically we do those during the midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um, are considered typical days. Um, just looking quickly. Um, the uh, Mass Ave access, um, it, it was stated that the intersection of Far Street and Mass Ave is one of the most dangerous in Arlington and the state. Um, the data that was collected and it doesn't necessarily back that up. Um, the data was, um, they revisited the crash data from the initial study in the response and all of the study intersections had crash rates that were below the um, statewide and district uh, district average, uh, mass dot district average. So, also there are there are maps publicly available online that show high crash locations based on crash data, and this does does not is not flagged as a high crash location. Um, so that may be overstated. There may be a perceived feeling of safety. I'm sure that that exists, um, but the, the actual crash data doesn't suggests that um, as far as um, additional adjacent properties that will be developed known um, known developments were factored into the study um, future developments it, we don't know what those are and there those developers it will be you know their their burden to 
determine what the, what the trip generation is for their sites and how that impacts the abutting roadways and how it relates to what's being proposed at this time. You know, obviously you handle these applications as they come in and that same, this same process will exist for those um, anticipated future uh, developments. Um, yes, and the disproportionate burden graphic is, um, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting study in comparing uh, number of cars by frontage, but I'm not sure exactly how the data was determined and, and the number of cars that they attribute to, um, to this site is, doesn't match what we're talking about for peak hourly additional trips. So I think while it is informative, it, it, it may be somewhat misleading. So that, that was our take when we looked at this document. And, and I think a lot of those points align with what um, Mr. Zamolka just, just clarified. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, questions from the board? I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I'm just trying to get a better sense for the flow on Ryder Street. So first off, can people turn um, from, is, does Mass Ave, does Ryder Street intersect with Mass Ave? No. No, no, no it does not. So, so I'm sorry, then from Forest Street. So can you go, if you're turning, if you're on Forest Street, can you turn at the end of Ryder Street and go up? To, toward Beck? Is that two-way as, exist, as existing, you can turn on from Forest onto Ryder Street up to Beck. Okay. However, as mentioned, we're, we're restricting turns out of our site. Right, and that was my next question, which is how is that enforceable? Because you're gonna have a sign and get that, that's no right turn. But uh, you, know, you do have traffic going in both directions past the entrance there, or I guess it's the exit. So uh, I'm just curious. I mean, you would hope that people would would follow along with the sign, but there's is there any way that that really can be enforced? Maybe I can jump in here, Brian, real quick. I mean, sure. uh, we're going to be um, orient orient the new tenants, the new residents before they come to the traffic patterns. We're going to be giving them, um, you know, kind of a tutorial, if you will, on um, the mobility options and um, encouraging the bike use and and basically training them on where to park and where not to park and how the cars can come in and out. Um, and um, that's going to be actively managed by the on-site management company, which is uh, uh, there on site in person and available 24-7. Um, and lastly, you know, the kind of the, the legal hook here is that uh, is something that we will be building in as a responsibility within their lease. So, you know, um, if, if there is a reoccurring problem, there's somebody to call and there's recourse that we can take um, through their lease. So just to clarify, you're saying if people were to repeatedly take a right hand turn, that that would actually be covered in the lease? Yes. It would be a lease violation. Yes. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. <clears throat> Questions for the board? Mr. Chair, I have one, one question, clarification really. <clears throat> um, you say that the traffic study was performed in the morning and the evening, but what times of the day were these at? I, I didn't quite catch the time of the day the traffic studies were pegged. Was it a specific so, time or a, a general time? Yeah, so um, for the tra dem uh, for traffic engineering standards for a residential development, we study the weekday morning peak hour, peak period, which is 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, which is peak commuting traffic for the morning. And then the evening or afternoon, however you perceive it, um, is 4, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So when we take, when we study the peak hour, it's the highest volume, the highest hourly volume within those two hour timeframes. 
Okay. And then you mentioned the net effect was didn't change much, which I assume was from the commercial to the residential, but um, is there a way to color it or, or maybe put in some lay terms just to give us some general sense of, uh, of what maybe the, I assume the residents may imagine what commercial activity was like in those businesses, which uh, my experience was that they weren't terribly heavy and a big apartment may feel like that maybe more. But my question really is, can you um, quantify it for us in a way that we can understand what commercial, what the basis of a commercial activity for that space was versus residential activity is? Um, I can, you know what, I can share my screen again and I could bring up that uh, slide that shows the driveway di uh, difference. If I could, here we go. There we go. Um, so let's let's look at uh, the. I mean, I'm try. I if I can, I want to try to uh, uh, you know respond to your your question appropriately. So I guess you're asking what the existing trip generation is and what the future is, and that's how we got the net. Uh, am I understanding correct. that? Correct. Yeah, that, correct? that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that's that's a fair point. Um, so. When we are doing these these you know large sites, um, there you get the trip generation of the overall site. So um, you can see that existing the site in the morning was 100 trips uh, in the evening 86. Um, we use standard traffic engineering methodology, which is um, to estimate the the number of trips per use. Uh, it's done with the by the Institute of Transportation Engineers trip generation. Uh, it's a compilation of, it's a rate, the trip generation rate based on national studies, and that's used as a baseline um, for the trip generation. And then what we do to, uh, to uh, obtain the mode share, so the number of vehicles versus number of pedestrians versus transit versus uh, bicycles, is we, we look at um, various documents. So we looked at the master plan, the 2015 Arlington master plan. And then we also looked at the uh, census, the US census track data. And what, when we worked with beta and we looked into this um, more, you know, more look, looked into this more, um, we found that the census track data more accurately represents the, uh, the trip generation. And given the, uh, the proximity to the Minuteman commuter bikeway and the transit, we uh, assumed that there's a, about, I, I want to say about a 65 to 70% um, use of vehicles. So after all that, um, so we obtained the trip generation of the building, um, distributed it based on the, uh, the volumes that were obtained. So the existing traffic volumes for each driveway. And then we took those volumes and took it away from the site. Um, and then when we tried to, when we calculated the trip generation for the proposed development, we distributed the traffic based on the access that we're proposing and the, um, the, distrib the natural distribution of traffic throughout the corridor. So a lot of traffic on Mass Ave and not as much on Forest and very little on Ryder. Um, so that's how we got those net volumes total for the site and for each driveway. I hope that answered your question. If not, I, I could provide more information. I'm sure you technically answered it very well. <laughs> and, and I apologize if, if um, that, that went over my head, but maybe the, the okay. comment, maybe the comment is <laughs> you've got an office building that has, I don't know how many tenants, you know, 10 tenants, and there may be a perception or at least I can imagine there being a perception that uh, and that this current existing office complex or has it feels like less usage than than the size of the residential complex coming yep. in. But what I hear is that that the 
the difference in usage from a vehicle standard is about the same. And I, and it just didn't make sense to me. And that's what, that's what I was just trying to understand the differences. That, that's all. Okay. And, and, and maybe what you've said is, is the answer and, and, and you can't really dumb it down any more than that, but it was just to try to, to, to under physically understand the differences that that's all. Yes. And I, I mean, if you have any further question beyond this and you, I, I can, definitely sit down with you and explain more. Um, yeah, maybe that's a good way to address yeah. <laughs> No, that's fine. Thanks. Hmm. That, that's all, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, please. Yes. Um, so in response, in, in response to that comment, and um, just an attempt to, to summarize a little bit more of what um, Brian just said. So we calculate the existing trips for the office building based on rates that are captured in the Institute of Transportation, the uh, Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. We reduce that based on what we expect from mode share to say how many of those trips, which are people, are actually cars, which are, you know, vehicle volume, and then do the same thing for the residential development to determine. So now we know how many trips we expect the existing office to be generating, how many trips, vehicle trips, we expect the residential development to be generating. And that's that net difference that was shown in the presentation. Um, Brian, was it 15 in the morning and 15 30, in the morning, 29, yeah, 30 in the 30, evening. 30, so, you know. So and, it's and, not based off an actual count, it's based off of uh, an, an, an average of, of all offices? It's bit, yes, it's Correct. based off an average of all offices. I see. Okay. And so, you know, and so those, those 15 in the morning and, and 30 in the afternoon are actually really good numbers to understand because 15 means one every four minutes, 15 over 60 minute period, one every four minutes, 30, one, over, one every two minutes over 60 minute period. So that's the expected new trips to be generated in addition to what already may be generated by the office. That's how many new trips you'd see. One every four minutes in the morning, one every two minutes in the afternoon. Okay. And yeah. we concur Thanks, with guys. that uh, methodology. Uh, we concur with that methodology. That's appropriate from an industry standard, the methodology that um, that Brian is, that Mitch has used in their, in their study. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hamlin. Um, on page eight of the, I think it's the beta comments. There's a table there that involves mode, different mode split uh, arrays. One of them comes from the master plan. One of them is labeled TIR. And for cars, at least, it's 5% less than the master plan. And then the census tract is 74% uh, as opposed to the master plan, 72%. So I'm assuming that from this point of view, um, the using a larger uh, mode split to, for cars tends to be conservative, right? That, 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 minimum, that uh, would maximize the number of entrances and exits by cars at these locations. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify, I thought uh, that um, Mr. Zamolka said that they determined that the census tract uh, mode split was the one that was the most important, uh, the most um, appropriate. Uh, and that one is also the highest one at 74% for cars, uh, which is a little higher than the master plan and a bit higher than the TIR. And I just wanted to verify fi that that's the case that, and that if that's true, then presumably the, I mean, you know, the actual predicted generation of traffic is influenced quite a bit by the mode split uh, and what I gather was used here was a relatively conservative one that used a relatively high allocation of trips to cars. Is is that a right, the right way to read this, or am I missing something? So you you did you have read that correctly. Um, what that table represents is kind of the comparison between what we used in the initial study and the uh, revised study. Um, 
So what you're, you're seeing in the um, master plan and the census tract data is 5% higher, but um, what, when these uh, mode shares are calculated, especially the master plan, it, it, it takes into account all of Arlington and the census tract data takes into account a very large catchment area. Um, this site is very um, specific in terms of it, it, we can put more emphasis on transit and um, biking because of the proximity to the, the transit, the bus stops, the commuter bikeway and the mass ave accommodation. So that's why we uh, are able to modify the mode share slightly, but we are still uh, very conservative in, in keeping with, um, with the general uh, study that the town and the U.S. Census has, has uh, concluded. So for the calculations, Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up. Please. If the calculation, the calculation you actually used in the projection of the, the trips in and out, uh, just just to be clear, was that used? As, did that assume a seventy four percent by car mode share? And if not, what number was used? It was the sixty nine percent because it was it was the. So you you are reading it correctly. You are reading that graph or uh, table correctly, except um, the incorrect co column because yeah. what we're using the uh, the revised TR is the adjusted mode share because of the uh, proximity to the bikeway in the transit. Okay, got it. Thank you. So you are reading it correctly. Thank you. Um, so I had, um, are there any other questions from the board? I have a couple. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Okay. Um, so coming at so the, the the Rider Street, you had spoken specifically that with the no right turn on to Rider Street, then there will be no traffic turning then left on the back to go out to forest. Um, and just confirming, obviously, the, the opposite direction doesn't make any sense because there will not be an ability to access the site from Ryder Street. Is that correct? That's correct. And the tenants and residents will be aware on day one that they cannot access that way. Um, and then is the so the re, the reconfigured bridge um, over the brook is will that be a two way bridge? That will be a two-way bridge, um, but for the there we have. I don't. I don't want to bring up the slide again, but um, we have the wayfinding signs that do not enter, and the um, all traffic turn left. That will be immediately uh, once you coming south, exiting from the site, you will be hit in the face with that signage. There will also be pavement marking saying. You cannot, residents and tenants cannot use the Mass Ave driveway. They must turn left onto Quinn Road if you're, if you choose to go out to Mass Ave anyway. The alternative is to go out to Ryder Street. Okay. So there, so that it is possible for residents and tenants to get to that point, but then they would have to turn left to go down to Quinn Road. They would Correct. not be allowed to go forward. And again, this, it would be a lease restriction that should you choose to violate it, then you're in, in violation of your lease. Correct. And then coming in off of Mass Ave, so that, as you say, it's a 20 foot right of way, um, which is pretty much 20 feet right now, curb to curb. So there's not room for a sidewalk. There is a telephone pole in the middle of the street. Is that being relocated as a part of this project? Want me to address that, Brian? Sure, go ahead, please. Um, the, the tell we've, looked into the logistics of relocating that telephone pole and um, not not to say that we've closed the book on this, but um, it does not look like there is a, a viable and achievable path to, to move that pole. Um, and um, and our, our project is powered off of uh, a different entry point to the site. So, uh, you know, we'd certainly be open to considering if that pole can be removed. But what we're, what we're doing, Mr. Chairman, is leaving the condition the same as it is today. Uh, today, it is a privately owned uh, uh, property by the proponent with access by the neighbors. 
the telephone pole or the utility pole is there. It does not meet current standards, but it is what's in place as a lot of things in this world that we build on and around. And um, um, we are not um, actively pursuing changing that because uh, it doesn't seem to be feasible with the limitations that we have um, to ourselves. I mean, that pole would have to be placed within this 20 foot right of way, presumably, unless we could work with a neighbor to put it on another on, on their property. And we're happy to have those conversations. We've certainly initiated those conversations, but um, you know, we have to have a path forward to, to move the project and we're leaving this condition in the way that it's uh, operating today and not making it worse. Is the, no, it, to clarify something you had said, is the, does the poll serve this development and others or does it, who does, who does this poll serving? Do we know? This, this poll serves a number of the abutters. Okay. Yeah. So, so it would seem like it's easy to just kind of scooch it over, but the utility company says, well, you can't really put it like that at all. And by the way, all the services that it serves are kind of antiquated. We don't do it that way. And so it becomes this kind of impossible uh, Rubik's cube. And so we're not throwing in the towel to, on the ability to solve it, but I think this project alone can't solve it. And so if there's the will to solve it uh, with the abutters, then we're happy to you know, do our part, but we're not relying upon that pole for our power. Thank you. And then, um, so I spent a, a, some time there to, um, on site today, uh, sort of walking around. Um, the, the sidewalk coming down Ryder Street, where it crosses over the brook, um, there's about a foot drop off at that end of the sidewalk between the sidewalk height and, the, and grade. So I just want to bring that to your attention if you're not already aware of it. That, making that an, an accessible pathway is going to require some effort um, at the intersection of Ryder and the, the property uh, exit drive. Um, and the other thing I would like to en encourage um, the applicant to consider is having a pedestrian path to uh, the bikeway. Um, the bikeway receives, you know, as you've noted, you know, it's a, it's a bikeway. There's a lot of bike traffic that goes that way. There's also, um, I would think, a fair amount of pedestrian traffic from the project that would utilize that. Um, also with the athletic fields and the playground and the, the town rink on the opposite side from there. Um, it is something that the tenants um, can reasonably be expected to try to utilize um, depending on um, I'm not exactly sure about the, the which school districts they fall into. I don't know if they, if the residents would be headed in that direction. I think they are in the Pierce district, so they may head that way. I don't quite know, um, but that's another consideration um, for pedestrian access. And currently, the sidewalk ends at the at the driveway at the at, uh, where the Myrick property meets Ryder. So I would, um, I know that the the property it is a private way, and the properties are. Um, under multiple ownerships. Um, and I, I have tried to sort of instigate a look into seeing if it's possible to determine who actually has ownership over these parcels um, and whether this is something that could be considered. Um, but I think if, if that sidewalk could be made continuous from the corner with Mass Ave onto Ryder and then from Ryder all the way to the bike path, I think that would be um, be a worthwhile amenity not only for um, for the the residents of this new development, but I think it also addresses some of the issues that have been raised by some of the local residents that um, that you know that, that the use of Ryder Street is often considered dangerous, especially because everyone's out in the street. Um, I think that would be a, a useful thing. Um, the other thing that would be highly useful, um, in, at least in my walk today, is uh, some of the abutting businesses tend to use Ryder Street, the full width of Ryder Street as a parking lot, um, as opposed to parking on the side of the street. And that is, um, obviously that, that is a, 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 an enforcement issue with, uh, with abutting businesses violating the, the terms of the right of way um, through that area. And that's 
you know, not anything on the applicant, but I just wanted to, to raise that as a concern that you know, this is a, that the whole Rider Street corridor is, has a lot of issues about it that need to get addressed. Um, and many of these are beyond the area that are involved in this project site, but, um, but they are sort of tangential and they're things that, um, <clears throat> that ought to be considered, if not as a part of this project should be considered um, as sort of a more holistic approach to, uh, to Rider Street. Um, so with that, I don't know if there are any other comments from the board. Let's take a quick peek. Um, none. Um, board, now Mr. Uh, Klein, may I just respond very quickly? Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. Just so to, to not leave your comment yes, unaddressed, um, the pedestrian path that we are going to be constructing along the Millbrook, taking a left onto Ryder Street. We've studied the existing grades very closely, and um, with paying full. Um, respect to all the existing historic structures there and the, you know, uh, um, the uh, concrete and stone wall that the brook runs through without touching any of those um, and compromising them in any way. We, we are going to correct the grades and build a handicap accessible uh, path, an ADA accessible path from our uh, sidewalk along Millbrook onto the walkway that is on Ryder Street going over the brook. And we, and the condition you point out very astutely is something that we focused on. And so when we come before this group on the 23rd of March and we focus on site design related issues, we'll show you our approach to that. So thank you for pointing that out. I'm glad, I'm glad we were already on that one. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, you know, the, 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 pedestrian pathway to the uh, to the bike way down Ryder Street. You know, I, I think this is kind of a, a legal issue that goes beyond our control. Uh, we we own half of the right of way coming out the Ryder Street connector, taking a left onto Ryder. We own half of that Ryder up to Forest and we're offering to repave the entire width of that, not just our half. Um, and uh, in respecting where the neighbor's yards already kind of encroach into that right of way. And we're offering, and we believe it's city or town owned property rather to uh, repave the, um, the existing sidewalk and do the wheelchair ramps uh, that Brian explained. Um, and, but we all, that's obviously someone else's property. So we have to get their consent and permission to do that. Um, but we think that would be a big improvement for the neighborhood, including our project. Um, going the other way down Ryder, uh, you know, we, we don't really have a, a mechanism to do that. We don't own it. We don't, uh, um, there isn't a sidewalk, uh, to my knowledge, that is continuous, that runs along there. So uh, our hands are a bit tied with regard to that. So um, I just wanted to give you the feedback that we, you know, we've looked really hard at these things to try to understand them from a practical and an ownership perspective. And uh, we're trying to address the ones that we, um, that are in our control or that we can try to stretch to have in our control and, and do the right thing and do what we think is our proportionate share of that right thing. Great, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, so now we'll open the meeting to public comment. Uh, so public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matters at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. To provide an orderly flow for the meeting, the chair will limit individual speakers, excuse me, to three minutes each and to use, encourage them to use their time to provide comments related to the topics discussed at this hearing. Uh, the chair will grant additional time to allow questions to be answered. Please note there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have the opportunity for public comment. Chair also encourages the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. So the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for the previous hearing. Please select the raise hand button from the participants tab and or dial star nine if you're joining us by phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself with name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us generate accurate minutes. Once all public comments and questions have been addressed, 
before the allotted time has been extended. The public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. And the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comments, please ask us to do so. I'm just gonna take a quick note. Okay, so with that, I will um, Peter Marianos. So you go ahead, unmute yourself, uh, name and address for the record, and oops, you're still you're still muted, sir. Sorry, is that better? That is perfect. Thank you. I am Peter Marianos. I live at 17 Beck Road, and uh, I'm definitely of concerns like a lot of my neighbors do. Um, has anybody actually physically measured the width of Ryder Street? We'll ask, uh, We've done a very detailed survey of the land that we own in Ryder Street and that continuous piece from the Ryder Street driveway connector up to Forest. But has anyone actually measured the width of it, like where Ryder Street meets Forest? Because every time I go up it, I have to wait for the other guy coming the other way. So it's just not wide enough to support two-way traffic. Uh, right, Rider Street is uh, it's a 40 foot right of way. It's constricted on the nine Rider Street side by the cars that are most of the time parked there. And on the other side by the encroachment of the neighbor's uh, landscaped area into that roadway. So that's why it's narrow. Okay, because um, I, like I say, I mean, uh, do you guys anticipate removing those parking spaces? Because as it is, two cars can't go down it at the same time. Um, Mr. St. Clair, has there been any discussion about the the owner's um, stance on parking on Ryder Street? In, in, within his well, it, it's, it's privately owned land with public accessibility and we don't own it. So we can't, uh, we can't say you can't park there. We, we believe that's town owned land where the cars are parked in front of Nine Rider. Right, but on the opposite side, that is your property, correct? It, 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 it is where and where the yards encroach on it. You know, it 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 would not put us in a popular place to say we're going to come and tear up people's you know front yards that encroach on the road and pave it as roadway. So, well, our, Christian, I think your question is: Are we prepared to say that parking along the side of a Ryder Street that? the Myrax actually own by deed, um, they'll agree to that. I, I think they probably would. That was my question. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, I mean, I, uh, is that a fair statement, Daniel? Nobody uh, parks on that side, I think, as it is anyway. Well, you, we're talking about the north side. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah. right where Forest meets Ryder. Like that little small intersection that needs repaving, that just seems like a very small area to support the amount of traffic that you wanna, that you wanna, I guess, have come down, uh, come down that way. Um, and I was also kind of concerned about the uh, the amount of trips in the morning. And this goes back to Mr. Zamolka about the 15 and then the 30, 15 in the morning and 30 in the evening. I mean, if you've got all those people coming down that one way, and then you got, let's say, one of the abutters or me or somebody wants to come down Rider, there's already gonna be a swarm of vehicles trying to take a left onto, you know, onto Rider when we're just trying to cut through. So I mean, it just yeah, and, and that's that's a that's a fair point, but you have to um, we you have to look at it net wise. We're we're not changing the existing condition um, much as it is. We're only increasing it by one trip, and we're also on, we're restricting it to egress only to limit the amount of traffic on Ryder. We we understand that the neighbors have concerns about the use of Ryder Street, and we want to um, you know. Take that into consideration so we did uh with the access restriction any further oh sorry um yeah and uh um i like the idea of the sidewalk going down Ryder street um and i've heard a lot of talk about you know about you know good access to the bike path but 
Um, I would like for some of the board members or, you know, some of the other people yep. that are watching this to actually come down Ryder Street in the afternoon slash evening because there is a huge um, block. There is a I'm trying to think of a nice word of saying this. There's a lot of traffic down Ryder Street, especially down by the end by the landscaping company, because they have a lot of vehicles there that, frankly, block the entrance to the bike path a lot of the day. And I've got a lot of pictures and such. Uh, you know, relating to that. And even a video of a child on a bicycle, I just happened to be going down right at the right time. He was going down Ryder Street and I'm like, well, maybe that's a good time to record this because there's two big trucks blocking the entrance. And then of course he had to stop, get off his bike and maneuver around the vehicle. So there's just not a really good clear entrance there to that bike path when it really should be. It's just really overrun by commercial vehicles at this point. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, can I, I just ask a quick question? <clears throat> I go up, I go, I go walking through on Ryder Street and up to the path quite often, but probably not at a time of day that you would think is the most revealing. Uh, and I wondered if you could just tell me if I can pick times to go up and walk around there and and see the way this looks in a in a in a in the way that you'd like to show me. What would be the right time of day? Any time after three o'clock would be great. Okay, so some three to six, is that basically? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Perfect. thank you. That'd be wonderful. Thank you, sir. Um, next on the list um, is Nicole Weber. Sure, thank you. Um, 14 Ryder Street. Um, first of all, Christian, thank you for coming and visiting our neighborhood and seeing all its inequities as far as what's happening um, in the in the street, really. Um, Brian, can I, I'm, I'm a scientist, so I would really like to see your calculations along with Aaron and Patrick. I think I need to see how you got to the number you got because the 15 does not make sense to me. Um, living here, it just does not make sense. And so if you could share that, how you got to that calculation, it would be wonderful. Um, how are we gonna monitor parking on Ryder Street? I know you think that residents or friends of residents aren't gonna park on Ryder Street, but uh, I don't think so. So how are we gonna monitor that? Are we gonna have like a Ryder Street neighborhood you know, sticker that the police actually go and look at who's parking where and what's allowed. Um, the speed bump location is not going to help the middle schoolers going to school. Um, if you repave that area in the beginning of Ryder Street, um, that's going to speed up everybody coming into Ryder Street. And I have a middle schooler and that's going to be a big deal. Um, so we have so the amount of pedestrians that you have in the study as well is kind of concerning. Um, this is a huge throughway for middle schoolers. Um, adding 3% to your calculation doesn't seem enough for me um, from your engineering um, calculations. Uh, the sidewalk I love. And Danielle, as far as you said, beyond our control. Um, for this area, I really feel, and I think uh, my neighbors agree, that if we have the access point on Ryder be pedestrian and bike only, that would be a huge relief for us. Huge relief. And I think that is within your control. You already have two other points of entry. And I think that would be a really big changer for us as a community. We're dealing with all these other things the town of Arlington has the recycling right next door to us right now. We're trying to survive and have kids walk safely on these streets. So we need to come together and see the systems at play and actually support us as a community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Um, I'm going to address the first. Uh, do you want me to go walk you through the calculations now or I can provide you? I mean, we the provided TIR uh, has the calculations. Um, that can be off screen, that's fine. Okay. Perfect. 
Um, okay, I have two individuals who are both Mariah Contreras, so I will go with the. I'll, I'll let you, the two of you figure out which one wants to go first. He's pointing at you. <laughs> so, ma'am, don't you go ahead? Yeah. Uh, happened last time as well. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Thank you. Mariah Contreras. I'm a, a homeowner at Two Rider Street, just like last time. Um, so I, I was putting my uh, toddler to sleep at the beginning, but I'm aware, I, I've become aware of mention of a deed of apparently our house is encroaching on, and I'm just hoping to obtain the book and page number of the deed. We can we can provide that. It's on the Alta survey, the documents that were filed. It shows the surveyor shows that um, the yard substantially encroaches into the right of way. And part of the porch. Do you have a front porch as well? Uh, my my residence is not, but the um, attached condo does. Okay, then the, that part of the porch is on there as well. And that's a historic building. Just I don't know. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So on the Alta survey is the actual book and page number of the deeds as read in part of the register. If not, I can provide it. Should be on there. Thank you. Um, and then I have uh, another clarifying question um, in terms of so that just historically from whenever June on, we've received as as residents as the butters, we've received varying information about two access points versus three access points. We've been told that Qu at one point Quinn Road was not an option because that was the other Mirac family that they would have to turn to, God forbid. Uh, and so it's, it is confusing to us to constantly have to consider and reconsider two versus three and quite honestly versus one, what we think should probably be one access point. Um, for this project. Um, but given the current information that we provided tonight, I'm curious if the um, if it is supposed to be out uh, at, at an egress point onto rider left only, is that also true for um, cyclists who should be following car auto rules in Arlington? No, not for oh. cyclists. Cyclists yeah, not right. Yeah, we want to, we want to maintain that um, access for cyclists because they we don't want to restrict them to go to the Minuteman bikeway. And so, is there to be a separate cycle cyclist lane on that egress? And I guess in, and they can go in that way too. Cyclists can go in that way, yes. And would, is there going to be any sort of um, safety consideration for the cyclists of the building, or are they expected to use the roadway, driveway? Uh, they, they are, as standard, they will be using the, the driveway. There's no separated demarcation. And there's no intended, for the, for the safety of the residents, there's no intended um, separate cyclist path on that part of the road. All, all bike accommodations on Ryder Street and around uh, and all the abutting roadways are going to stay as existing. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about... Uh, you, the ten, your tenant. So when they egress, if a cyclist wants to go from the building to Ryder Street, do they have to use the the driveway, or do they get their own safe um, cyclist lane? I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, so right now, the they will be using the um, the Ryder Street access because I believe that is the only access point in the area. Uh, and Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't do not believe there's going to be direct access to the Minuteman bikeway. No, but I think the I think the question is: is there will there be a bike lane on the on your property side that is parallel to Mill Street, just you know, on its way out to um, Mill Brook. Mill Brook on its way to Ryder Rider Street? Street. No, there will not be a separate. Um, divided bike lane, there is a separate divided pedestrian walkway, and then the driveway is for both cars and bikes. But it's anticipated that it will be one direction for cars and two directions for bicycles? Correct. That's correct. And, and bicycles can make a turn that drivers cannot? Yes, correct. 
Okay. I think just as, as a concerned neighbor, um, that that leads to a lot of unpredictability for the automobile drivers. And that is amidst all the unpredictability in the street. So in terms, as, as someone who commutes via foot, cycle and automobile, um, to it may be of good consideration to include a bike path, especially given the differing rules um, for, for, and for the um, safety of what automobile, what autoists can predict. I also have a question uh, regarding repaving Ryder Street. So um, as Nicole alluded to, um, I sit on that small, our property sits on that small part of Ryder Street that's right at the, the T intersection there. And quite frankly, the potholes are the only thing that slow traffic down. And I would not, I would, I would stand in the potholes before they get paved over. Um, so I, I'm, I'm noting that there are other measures being taken on other egresses or ingresses for this project. And I would hope that there uh, is will to think um, appropriately as, as such in our eyes uh, about safety measures that could be um, completed on, on Ryder Street. If there's a will of all the abutters or whatever sufficient minimum of abutters needs to be had for that, but there's no, I'm, I'm hoping to clarify whether there's, there's no innate permission, like you'd have to only pave quote unquote, what you, what you own or have deeded and not the whole street without permission. We would have to, we would have to work that out with them. There are provisions um, under town bylaws about uh, paving of, of private ways. So um, the better, but the betterment issue with a town would require a certain percentage of abutters to agree to that, right? Well, no, the applicant would pay for it. But the applicant would pay for it, but it would be the abutting neighbors. So it would not involve, it would only involve those properties that directly abut the porch and to be paved. So my understanding of like betterment funds is that at least two thirds of the residents have to agree to betterment of the private way. I do not know that offhand. Uh, um, Hunter, do you know that rule? If, if, the, if the town is gonna assess a betterment, two thirds of the neighbors on the uh, private right of way, but the, the applicant is gonna pay the betterment. So there's um, no need for um, agreement. I mean, the, the agreement would be between if the town indeed took the side of Ryder Street by the condominium association, it would be an agreement with the town uh, for the Myrak family to pave that portion of the private way from the exit of Ryder, from the exit of the property up to Forest Street. And so then what responsibility for different, consider, what different considerations have not taken place for Ryder Street that are apparent next to Anisi's property? Like, why haven't those been considered for Ryder Street? There's plenty of creative modern solutions for slowing down traffic. And I'm glad to hear that the car counts won't be that much more. This is all assuming that the status quo is safe. It is not. So I, I just, again, the status quo, the number of cars that we have now is not safe. It, it, no neighbor, no abutter thinks that. And so I don't understand why there hasn't been cr creative, aesthetically pleasing, anything, like no consideration for rider other than an egress only. So you, and the egress only being a left, two left turns, a left turn onto rider, a left turn onto forest. My grampy would have a field day with this safety wise. Why would you have the left turns take place onto a pedestrian and cyclist heavy road. Well, so the I, logic is really is really skewed to me. And then the current like level of neglect to potential, you know, safety additions to rider is just, it's really, really concerning to me. Well, uh, let me just say this. I don't no, think- No, Connor, hold on one second. Um, we do just need to move along. So okay. I, I will 
asked that the that the applicant consider some consider traffic calming for that end of Ryder Street. Um, I, I was just going to say, Chairman Klein, that we have given a consideration. I was going to reiterate what they were, but we'll we'll consider some traffic calming as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then just lastly, I, we have not heard any. So we've had an issue already with um, the the equipment, and I say equipment. It's like a it's a huge piece of equipment. Someone else can correct me. Whatever it is, that's already been used to drill in the parking of the existing parking lot of the tenant, and already whatever vehicle is needed to take that uh, loader off has parked on Forest Street twice. Um, Arlington police have had to intervene because that can't fit down the road. So I'm very curious. We've heard nothing about the, the schedule of, uh, of construction and how vehicles will be accessing the site there when it's already obvious that such vehicles are, are going to be extremely disruptive to Ryder Street. The, the process for construction, it will be, come, will be a part of a forthcoming discussion. Um, but it's, it's because it's, it's more construction related rather than traffic in general related. So it's, it'll be coming at a, at a future hearing. Okay, thank so you. So that will be a topic, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the second Maria Contreras. Hey, can everyone hear me? We can. Oh, All right. yeah. This is Alex T, uh, also living at Two Rider Street. Um, again, I, I think a lot of the anxiety um, and nervousness that you're feeling uh, from the abutters is because our neighborhood is just atypical, right? We don't, or we're not gonna trust these engineering standards that apply to a general population when we experience, you know, strollers having to avoid excavators every day, when we see kids riding down on tricycles, right? And then we see contractors, you know, pulling through this, what should probably be a three-way stop, checking their phone, speeding off to their next job site uh, in an uncontrolled intersection. And so I think for me, what gives me hope is that you were able to come to the table with Robert and Essay and figure out how to resolve those issues. The, th the thoughts around kind of the, the Forest Rider Street intersection, like painting a sidewalk and putting in ADA accessible, that's great. Like that starts to really address things. Um, and, and I think for me, the intersection that has worried me most is where, where the, the egress point is going to meet Ryder. I 100% believe these are quite easily addressable, right? Uh, again, speed. There are so many ways to control speed. I would love to see, uh, you know, uh, Brian and, and you know, uh, Greg come to the table and like, hey, here are the seven ways we can do it, right? There are raised sidewalks, there are stop signs we can do, um, you know, uh, uh, widened sidewalks. It, again, the, the opportunity is there. And so, again, I think building off of what you were saying, uh, Mr. Klein, at the beginning, there, there's a lot of will here in the neighborhood. You know, the Lollicottas own that neighboring property. I think there's a way to get the right constituents to the table. And I know there's this, uh, the, this meeting on the 23rd. We want to be a part of that. You know, I think part of the challenge for us is that we've just felt really blocked out and frankly steamrolled. It's a feeling. I'm not saying that's actually what happened, but that's how it feels. Um, and again, I think we, there are just so many qualitative, uncontrollable, non-standard things about our neighborhood that that's what we want to address. We want to sit down and try to work through those with you um, so we can kind of have a better, a better place for every, for, for all, you know, the things that I would want us to consider is what is going to be the impact on the property if we make that an ingress point versus an egress point? I don't know. That's what I would love to understand from, from, uh, you know, Brian, what are the opportunities to have a raised sidewalk right there, right? So it could be a, both a speed bump. We've seen some beautiful executions of that in Somerville and other places to really slow down traffic. Uh, again, I'm sure there are some creative ways we could uh, at least paint some lines on the pavement to kind of make a, a, a bikeway or a pathway. Um, but again, you know, just last week, we saw like a car didn't know where to turn because it was trying to avoid another car and it was pointed right at a stroller. Those are the things that we see every day. And again, it's really hard to capture that in a number in a table. Um, and so again, that's what you're hearing us to respond to. And we want to just make sure that the kind of qualitative observations that we have sensed and lived and just clenched, uh, you know, day after day, that that gets addressed. And again, we, we want to be part of the process and as helpful as possible. Um, we, just, we just don't know the right avenues. And, and again, this is all new to us. So again, if, if you can give us a forum uh, to really come to the table and be collaborative, um, we're, we're more than willing. 
Yeah, these are these are great uh, comments about traffic calming. Um, definitely going to go back to the table and see what we can do to um, help calm traffic in your neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom Taylor. Oh, sorry. One, sorry. One more thing. Yes, please. Quickly. Oh, first. Uh, I, I would say 1030 a.m. is a really, really great time. That's when contractors are speeding off and, and you know, uh, trying to get to their next job. Uh, noon is another great time. And then, of course, when everyone's rushing home, trying to get home, 4 p.m. is another great time. So, again, just because of the nature of our traffic is so commercial right now, that is kind of the, uh, the harrowing hours. Great, thank you. And the middle schoolers. Yeah. Um, Nicole, you might know this better, but from my I knowledge. Can move on to the, to the next speaker, please. Yeah, middle school is at 3.15, starting anywhere from 3 o'clock to 3.40, and it's really important to see the middle schoolers walk through. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, Tom Taylor. Hi, um, uh, Mr. Chairman Klein and board members and presenters. Uh, thank you for making time for this. Um, I live at 23 Forest Street, which uh, is at the end of Ryder. Um, and we've been here since 94. Uh, and I just want to echo a number of comments that folks have made. Um, for a February uh, time study uh, to be considered as representative of the traffic, especially during the construction season and now with DPW, um, it does the three percent adjustment just as uh, it doesn't do it, and so one request I would have is that the board consider doing a, a time study and a traffic study in June or July, um, if you have all this lead time to uh, before construction evidently starts. I would just ask that that be a consideration um, because it's not only the business vehicles that come out um, and park daily, it's, it's all the workers. Um, many of them are low, low, low paid uh, construction workers. And so they drive in um, and I can't tell you the number of years we've had to put signs out on the street to say, please don't park here. And that's both at the condo building at our property. Um, I'd also like to make a, a comment about the encroachment at the end. Um, that was done, uh, I would say around 2000, maybe a little bit before. Uh, my wife and I um, made every effort to put up signs, uh, to slow the traffic down. Um, and it wasn't out there in the beginning, but uh, the construction vehicles just roared out of there. They were trying to, you know, get to their construction site, bring materials, etc. But they destroyed um, a number of bushes. Uh, the big rocks are out there to slow the construction trucks down on the way out and on the way in, because we just have really rapidly moving vehicles uh, in the neighborhood. So, um, the encroachment uh, on a general road, um, my wife and I have already talked about adjusting that. Uh, however, uh, we do want the traffic to go slow um, as opposed to fast. And that's one way that we in our private road uh, can do that. We can get it slowed down uh, because typically, uh, it is very speedy traffic. Um, so I would ask that the, the board consider uh, scheduling or uh, mending or doing an additional uh, traffic study during the, the summer hours. Um, the other thing that I would mention is we have the ice rink and the park uh, on the other side of uh, the end of Ryder Street and while it may not be in the direct purview, uh, in the space of the development, um, during the summer, there's hockey, there's uh, 
there's soccer, there's lacrosse, and the other, the big uh, parking lot uh, tied to that facility um, is often full. And what happens to Ryder Street is the overflow of parents and families come out on those nights and the road is jammed. There is no way that a large truck, when everything is parked for those public meetings, could get through. Um, so I too am uh, encouraged by uh, some of the efforts the, the presenters have made uh, in developing the process and taking into account some of the, the safety issues. But um, I really hope that the board will take the time to do another spring uh, traffic study, I'm sorry, summer traffic study. And I think that's about it for me. Um, so I wanna I want thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, we really are interested in creating and working with the developers to make a project that's safe and uh, meets the needs of, of everybody. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate thank you. the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, Nicole Weber, for a second time. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to mention that a lot of residents feel like construction is already happening. We've been having a shaking um, household experience in the neighborhood that I want to put on record. And two, um, the middle school time is they're supposed to be at school at eight, uh, what is it, 8.30 and they get out at 2.56. So time around that would be important to monitor and the exit way that you're proposing with this building would coincide with their entry to school. Um, that is directly, um, an issue. So if you reverse that, it might be another, another option, but um, just something to note. Thank you. Um, Thank you. To follow up just briefly, um, the house shaking you were describing, is there a particular time of day or date or? I will give my residents, uh, my, follow, my fellow neighbors space to share. <laughs> Mr. Mr. T? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the, the, uh, the, the biggest moment was just when the excavator, I think, was doing some soil sampling. And so it's one of the bigger excavators I've ever come, seen come down this street. I think it barely cleared the power lines. And uh, yeah, no, it felt like World War II and just, you know, these big tanks were running, running right through the street. So again, we understand that's going to be part of the process. I think um, we, we just, I mean, I'm concerned about my ancient foundation falling apart through this process. That's a meeting for another day. Um, again, I think a coordinated disruption or are there alternative temporary measures where we could access the site from the other side? Whole host of options out there, but it is a uh, active concern. And so at the very least, some heads up into when this was happening would be fantastic as we are all conducting work from home. Well taken, thank you. Any further Public comments, Ms. Leroyer. Hi, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't find the um, raised hand. It was not on my screen. Um, I'm at 12 Pier Street, uh, just across Forest Street from Ryder Street. So at that kind of crux of an intersection, um, I, I wanna reinforce a lot of the comments that have been made already about um, concerns about increased traffic and speed in this general area. Um, I think that none of, I mean, very little attention was given to pedestrians in the various reports, I thought. And um, obviously the Addison School students are um, a big important part of it. I, I see kids going up and down. I walk up and down Ryder Street myself a lot to go to the bike path. Um, it, there's a lot of people that walk up and down that street all the time. and. Um, the sidewalk that's there now is really not useful to people that are going down to the bike path. Um, hopefully, I mean, it sounds like you're going to be 
improving it and fixing the grade at the end of the, by the brook there, and that's great. Um, any other dish, other traffic comment that's been discussed, I think will be great to um, control people coming in and out of Ryder Street at Forest. Not very little has been mentioned about Forest and Mass Ave intersection, which um, is also a problem, especially in the morning. Um, there's a lot of traffic that comes down from Turkey Hill that, come, that comes down Forest to Mass Ave. That's a, that intersection backs up all the time. People then use um, my street, Pierce Street, to get away from Forest to cut through to hit Mass Ave, you know, further west. Um, that may increase traffic, um, but that's a bad intersection in and of itself, Forest and Mass Ave. And, and this whole complex of Forest, Pierce, Mass Ave, that whole tiny block there, plus there's going to be new commercial activity at 5 Forest Street. Um, anyway, it's, it, it, as uh, I think Mr. T said, it's a, it's a messy, strange neighborhood um, with lots of different uses and a lot of historic problems that have never been resolved. But, and I know that you, the, the Virex can't solve all of these, but um, just to be aware of the, the complexity of this neighborhood, small, small neighborhood. I mean, it's a really, it's just a, a small number of streets, but it's, it's very complex. Um, so anyway, thank you for their thinking about all these things. Thank I did. I did send a letter in to, for the record. So you did receive it. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, just on that on that topic of Forest and Mass Ave, I reminded me um, the timing is unfortunate, but the so the town has a a study group that is looking at the intersection of Massachusetts Avenue and Appleton Street and Appleton Place. Okay. Um, and so their first meeting is um, next week, Tuesday, March twenty third at seven p.m., um, which coincides beautifully with our, <laughs> our next meeting. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, and I believe that there's a, there is some, I, I received it through some mailing list from town. So, um, but if you reach out to the, uh, the senior transportation planner um, through the Department of Planning Community Development, uh, this Daniel Hamstutz, he can help you um, Get hooked up with that group if you're if you're interested in, in looking at some of the mass ab issues um which I, I think that this appleton project will probably look a little more holistically hopefully uh, within those streets um uh, mr t for a second uh you're, you're on mute though thank you uh my, my, i guess my main question here my only question is where should we direct ideas or observations to? Um, I, I feel like so far it's been a little bit of a game of telephone where it's been hard for us to get on the same page and I, I may have created a lot of unnecessary work for you all as well. Is there an opportunity to connect directly with Brian uh, uh, and or Greg in this process? So I'm not 100% sure about that, Ms. O'Connor. I think it should be uh, filtered through me. Okay. Um, do you want me to, so I can, so Mr. T, I can send you um, Mary O'Connor's email address if you want to get in touch with her, because uh, she's the, the attorney for the applicant, and she can put you in touch with um, with her team. Um, but certainly in, in talking through um, this evening, I'm wondering if there's possibly an opportunity for sort of a a little bit of like an offline conversation that could happen, you know, a meeting that wouldn't necessarily need to be a meeting of the, the ZBA, but would be an opportunity for some members from the community to speak directly with some members of the design team and uh, possibly some of the, the consultants for the applicant, if that's something that we might be able to, to try. That would be, that would be highly desirable if it's a possibility. All right. Okay. I, I will talk to my people and we'll set something up. Okay. Um, I mean, I just want to remind the board that uh, my client reached out in June to the neighborhood and uh, made a presentation and made the traffic study. So um, it, they've been prepared to communicate with the neighbors all along. Well, good. I think, that, I think that'll be that'll be helpful. Um, I'm looking around, see if there's any 
what else is, I, uh, have, if there's anybody with their anybody waving see nobody waving Here. Um, typically, we allow people to speak twice. Ms. Weber will give you a, a third, um, and that'll be the, the last public speaker for today. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to respond to Mary's comments. Like, we were so excited about being part of the conversation. We gave a lot of ideas. We just want some follow through on some of the issues we're having. That's it. And we're and and we're seeing that, but we just want to take another another step. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to close the public comment hearing uh, period for tonight's meeting. Um, are there further questions or comments from the board based on public input, Mr. Hanlon? Um, I just wanted to uh, say, just to so the point doesn't get lost, the discussion that we had a little while ago about, I believe it was Ms. Weber who brought this up, but it, I might be, might be misremembering that, about the structuring of the bicycle access uh, and its relationship to the uh, automobile egress on from the site onto uh, Rider Street struck me as a problem, really in some ways it's largely a problem of the people who will live in this in this community, but um, it's a problem that that required a little bit more thinking through. Um, it did seem to me that the, the what was being described to us by Mr. St. Clair was a little bit disorderly and uh, the idea of having people take their bicycles and turn left into an egress that for the bicycle is two ways, but for the car is only one, uh, is potentially dangerous, it seems to me. And I wonder if there's, if there, if when you think of it as a problem and just think about trying to s solve it with marked lanes or, or, I mean, there must be a large number of solutions, which are not necessarily big ticket items. Uh, I just like to encourage you to give some more thought to it and see if that's a problem that if it really is a problem and you could persuade me that it's not, if there's evidence about that, but uh, uh, that if it is a problem, it ought to be soluble and it'd be nice if you would take a look at it. Thank you. Chair, may I um, interject? Sure. Yep. So, so, Mr. Hanlon, thank you for your comments. Uh, I agree that uh, um, Ms. Contreras' comments about how we can maybe better manage that traffic flow is something that we can address. And um, there, and like, likewise, I think, you know, I, I want to just point out to people, we, we came to this meeting today offering to do some things that we had not offered to do before. We were deliberate about studying what the... Um, what the problems were and gathering comments. And this has been a useful dialogue, you know, and what, what we offered was to do um, uh, an upgrade to, to the sidewalks um, and repaving the whole right of way in the section from um, Forest to the Ryder Street connector. And if that's not the right response or the desired response, you know, we can redirect our efforts in other ways um, and I do think there are a number of things with signing and um, pavement marking and other things that um, would uh, maybe be a better solution for all parties involved. And um, we are committed to getting there. So uh, we'd like to have that conversation sooner rather than later. Um, you know, there are limits to what we can do, but we'd rather channel those resources in a way that we think people are gonna see the, the greatest benefit. So you'll have our commitment as a proponent to do that. And we look forward to having that conversation with this group sooner rather than later and addressing the neighborhood's concern and Mr. Uh, Hanlon's um, underscoring of those comments in a constructive way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Being none. Um, so the, so by prior arrangement, the next hearing on this project, 
1165 RMS app will be held on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7.30 p.m. over Zoom. Uh, the topic for that hearing will be stormwater, wetland, and riverfront aspects of the project. Um, so Mr. Hanlon, can I have a motion to continue? Mr. Chairman, I move that the hearing in this case be continued to a date certain of February 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Just correcting to March 23rd. Excuse me, March 23rd. February would be a step backwards, I guess. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Quickly run down the list. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Grevelak? Aye. Wonderful. We are continued. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I uh, wish to thank Rick Ballarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has questions or comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA's website. So to conclude tonight's meeting, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All board members in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Board is adjourned. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.